Crime Cafe, and I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Today, I'm going to be talking to author Dale Phillips. However, before I introduce him, uh, I would like to uh, remind you that the Crime Cafe Season 1 Story Package is available from my website. You can go to either crimecafe.net or debbiemack.com and click on Crime Cafe to find all the episodes as well as the story package and t-shirts, mugs, other Crime Cafe merchandise. And uh, in any case, I hope you'll check that out. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to this great mystery writer I've got who has had the most extraordinary life, <laughs> Dale Phillips. Dale is the author of the Zach Taylor series, which I've been following ever since he, po he published his first novel. So, uh, Dale, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Debbie. Great to be here. Appreciate your hosting. Wonderful. And um, tell us about Zach Taylor and the series. Zach Taylor came about from an idea I had many, many years ago about wanting to host uh, or write a story about a man who comes to Portland to avenge the death of a friend, Portland, Maine, because I grew up in Maine, and I thought there were more stories in Maine besides those of Stephen King, and I wanted to tell some of them. So I thought it would be a great setting apart from Boston or L.A. or Chicago that many mystery readers are familiar with, the big city, where somebody's very well connected. Somebody's been there forever and knows everyone and, and knows the police and has these great relationships. I wanted something different. How about a fish out of water who comes to a completely different place and has no bearings, no relationships, no anchoring, and is trying to uh, solve a very difficult mystery and there's one more thing. He doesn't like guns and doesn't use them. And he's going up against people who do. So I started writing the one book and realized, well, there's more than just one book here. This is a whole series. And book four is coming out next week. Well, I have to say, um, I like that premise. And I've enjoyed the books very much so far. The fish out of water concept is one that I like a lot. And... Uh, I wanted to ask you, your series uh, seems to be what I would call hard-boiled mystery. Would you agree with that? Yes, very much so. Um, I grew up in the traditional school of reading everyone, starting with Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, uh, even Mickey Spillane, Jim Thompson, John D. McDonald, up through uh, Robert B. Parker, Elmore Leonard, Donald Westlake. And I really love that world that they create that a little bit cynical and a little bit weather beaten and this kind of tarnished knight walking down those mean streets and then trying to set the world to rights. And I love that concept and I wanted to uh, basically pay homage to it in these novels. Well, I think you do that very well. Uh, have you ever pictured your books as movies? Yes, I have. I was, I was thinking, um, who would be able to play it? And again, you know, actors come and go in Hollywood of who's hot and, and whatnot. And after I saw Matt Damon and the Jason Bourne films, I said, there's somebody who's physical enough because the books are about a martial artist. Since he doesn't use guns, he has to use his wits. So he's got to be smart and he has to use his physical skills. And uh, he's a martial artist. So he's been a kickboxer and he's not afraid of you know, getting into a good scrap. And when I saw uh, Matt Damon take on the role of Jason Bourne and become that, I said, well, I didn't know he had that kind of physical skills to really pull that off. And now he's, I don't know, I don't know if he's getting too old now uh, as far as Hollywood. I was thinking Tom Hardy might be wonderful. Uh, the man who was in uh, the recent Mad Max Fury Road, he was in The Drop. Uh, he seems to have the right uh, gravitas, the right note of intelligence of hanging back a little, but but being able to step up to the challenge when needed and take on a very uh, physical activity. Well, those are all interesting suggestions. Um, the state of Maine seems to be prevalent in your writing in general. Very much so. In the novels or in, in uh, short stories. 
Uh, can you comment about that? Sure can. Well, uh, I was lucky enough to have Stephen King as a writing instructor back in college. So when you start with that, uh, it will have an influence on you. But what I liked about King's work was that it really showed the, the small town life of Maine to perfection. You read that and I know those people. I mean, I, I live them. You know, somebody sneezes down the street and you're passing them a, a tissue, that sort of thing. And he really outlined what it's like to live in that atmosphere and what it's like to be an ordinary person who suddenly is pulled into an extraordinary situation. And that's kind of what I wanted to show that uh, Maine, the people are very self-reliant. They step up when needed and they get through some of the most impossible situations. And with with very little resource except themselves and you know what's inside them they're able to make do and I wanted to bring that forth hmm yes um, what was it like to study with Stephen King fantastic he is a, a consummate professional he demanded much of us we had to write 25,000 words in a semester which is about half a book and uh, he constantly went over the stories looked at what we'd written and showed us how to make it better uh, in all aspects, you know, with the dialogue, the, the narration, plot points, uh, grammar, punctuation, spelling, everything. He was a fully rounded teacher and made you excited about the work and want to do better, want to become a professional, want to become a craftsperson to make it the story good and to tell it the best way possible. What was he like as a person? so down to earth. Uh, the thing with a lot of writers is when I was very young, I saw them as the gods on Mount Olympus. Oh, yeah. And then I started meeting them and talking with them. And many of them are just basic down to earth people who, if you didn't know they were a writer, you, you'd never guess. They just walk by us unnoticed. And Stephen King is so laid back, even with the immense fame he's received and the adulation. There's a couple of stories I like to tell that um, he was actually on two different occasions sitting with Bruce Springsteen and Bono and people came up with autograph books in hands and the music stars turned in expectation and the people went straight to Stephen King instead and had him sign the books. Hmm. Wow. That's really something. Um, you've written a lot of short stories, I noticed. Yeah, so different I genres. Over 50 short stories. Um, that's I'm not amazing to me. What's that? Um, that's amazing to me. Oh, uh, well, it's just, I started late in life. I'm, I'm a little older than a lot of writers begin. And there was a lot of mean time in between the, the college writing. And I only started getting books published four years ago. But I had this great well of stories that needed to be told. And they came pouring out. And I'm not concerned about the genre until the story's done. And then I kind of look at it and say, okay, what would somebody else want to pigeonhole that story as? Would that be a science fiction? Would that be a fantasy? Would that be a horror? Would that be a crime and mystery? Um, it just tell the story and then let it tell you what it is afterwards. That sounds like good advice, actually. I've never and approached it quite of that way. Sometimes I have a great idea and I develop it from that. And sometimes I'm just simply writing, as Dean Wesley Smith calls it, writing into the dark. You just begin and trust the process, trust your unconscious to take you where into something good. And this is where the best writing comes from, is that unconscious. The conscious mind is too much of an editor and is always criticizing even as you're writing and telling you, oh, no, that's not good. Oh, cut that out. Oh, nobody will believe that. If you write into the dark, if you, if you don't know yourself where it's going, it's scary, it's frightening, it's dark. And that's a wonderful place for a writer because as excited as you are about the story, the reader's going to feel the same way. Well, I'd say that's very good advice. Thank you. You know, a lot of people wonder about things like that, about structure and how to create a story, but... Uh, what you're saying makes sense. Well, a lot of literary writers try too hard to uh, focus on the literary at the expense of telling a really good story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of readers don't mind a few rough edges. If they're pulled along and they're into it, 
they're with you all the way. And Virginia Woolf said, you know, I can, if I can just get you interested in the character, it doesn't matter what that character does after that because you're there. And I love that advice and really seek for something like that in a lot of my writing. You know, sometimes it's the idea of what's happening in the story, but it's what's happening to these people, these characters. And I, you know, you and I are, we are the gods in Olympus. We make up worlds and we inhabit them with people and we make them do things. Sometimes they do their own things and don't listen to us. But this is all part of the fun process and it's, a, it's an amazing creative thing we're able to do. I have no music ability uh, at all. And I'm fascinated by those who do and are able to create sounds out of nothing and put them together in a tonal format and make them pleasing to other people. I can't do that with musical notes at all, but I can do it with words. And that's what I think, you know, the writers do is they, they string these utterances we have, which represent ideas and we put them into these long chains, but we're really storytellers around the campfire down at heart. That's what we do. That's a good point. And I like that. Uh, let's see. You've also written jokes and poetry. <laughs> Yes. For a living? I, I, for a living. <laughs> you, you haven't seen the pay rates for that, have you? <laughs> no, I haven't actually. <laughs> no, my first successful writing sale was to Boy's Life way back about, oh, almost 45 years ago or so because they would publish jokes and send you a dollar. And so I got two different jokes published in Boy's Life for which I was very happy. My first professional sales. And uh, my poetry back then was really awful. It got a lot better afterwards. <laughs> I actually got in the Boy Scout handbook because they did an ad from Boy's Life and they showed my name and address in the Boy Scout handbook as part of the ad. So I was like, oh, accidental fame, I'll take it. Oh my gosh, to be paid to write jokes. Sounds pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> And you've done a lot of traveling. You've been all around the U.S. and gone overseas. Uh, what's your favorite place that you've been? Oh, boy. Um, That's a tough question, I know. Yeah, you know, that the thing I love is, is I love going to another place and experiencing what it's like there and not expecting it like some people. I want to carry my home to another place and expect the other place to be like home. That's that's not what I do. I, I go there and see, show me what you've got. So I, I loved Europe. I went with two friends and we backpacked all around Europe. And what an experience of never knowing where you're going to be the next night. But, you know, you've got a rough plan, but you're not quite sure. It's like, hey, let's stop here and do this. Oh, let's go over and see that. Let's take a train to here. I mean, it's that kind of serendipitous, um, wonderful adventure that, uh, that wander yard that a lot of people do that really gives you a lot of experience and you meet all different types of people. And again, that's that scary part again. Writers should be a little scared a lot of the time because that's what incites us to make really good work. I like that. I like that philosophy. And personally, I love to travel. So I'm, I'm with you there. And yeah, when you go another place, you want to find out what the culture is like there. Not Very much so. I'm the not food, like, the people, yeah, I mean, exactly. the, the culture. I'm not the type to feel like I have to go to, you know, McDonald's if I'm in Italy or something. I've no. traveled with some people who did that, and I was just so ashamed. I mean, I was, like, I was mortified that they would do that. It's like, you're here having an experience that you can't get elsewhere. Enjoy exactly. this experience. Exactly. Do as much as you can. Perhaps that's what... That's the, the seed within writers that makes us want to become writers, to, to live more than one life. We get to have multiple lives. We're almost immortal. Our words can be read <laughs> 400 years from now. We're time travelers. We're talking to people in the future already. This is wonderful. And that, as, oh, sorry, funny. with Back to the Future, I mean, today's the day that it's no longer the future, it's now the past. So <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, the future comes at us so fast now that... Uh, it's really hard to keep up. <laughs> it's, it's coming at us like a DeLorean going 88 miles an hour, I tell you. It's really something, yeah. Um, you've had a, an amazing variety of jobs uh, from 
holiday Santa to blackjack dealer. Um, I imagine a lot of this has been, uh, fu um, you know, food for, for your writing thought. Oh, this is great fodder for writing. The, the exactly thing, growing fodder. up in Maine, and I grew up without much money, so you took whatever work was available, and that meant, you know, whether it was being a holiday Santa or whatnot, you took what there was because that's how you got by. But man, does that give you a, a slice of life for seeing what the different classes are like, what people do, um, how to get by, and working with all strata of society. Uh, gives you an understanding and an empathy for many other people and their situations. And again, I, I, I call that part of the writer's toolbox. Um, if you've done one thing all your life, you're going to have a limited window of what's out there. And if you've just tried to go and do as much as you can and lived a full life and done, you know, even dirty, disgusting work and done really clean work, you know, whatever it's going to give you different aspects of life. I agree. I think that's true for anybody, especially for writers, but uh, for anybody in the world, actually, no matter what you do for a living, it gives you perspective to have these different jobs and go different places and do different things. I think that's why I said when you, when you said, how can you write all these stories? Almost every job I have, you know, you can get, several stories out of each one. The things you've done that make it interesting, uh, the people you've met at that job that make it interesting. Hey, what if this happened? Take Stephen King again as, a, as an example. He worked in a uh, laundry and there was this big machine called the Mangler because if you got any your hand anywhere near it, the thing would pull it right in and could you know, tear it right off. And he took that concept and turned it into a story and that was one of his early uh, successes. Oh my gosh. You know, this is just talking to you about this is really inspiring. I got to have to tell you. Um, well, people are always asking, where do you get your ideas? And I just laugh and say, they're all around. You can reach out. Ideas are everywhere. And writers, we're like sausage makers. We take a little bit of this and a little piece of that and, and something from over there. And we toss them into this big bin and we grind it up. And what comes out is not one particular thing, but a mix of all the things that we've experienced, all the things we've seen, and here's a particular flavor of sausage that no one else can make because that's our particular filter and our recipe for making something special. Well, I like the way you put that. Uh, tell, tell us about your experience with being on Jeopardy. <laughs> my Since gosh, I, was... I tried to get on Jeopardy and I got a pencil for my efforts. <laughs> You must be oh, really good, good at answering answer. questions. I think you actually, uh, yeah, you were, were ahead of me on that one. No, I, um, I'd always wanted to be on Jeopardy since the old Art Fleming days, the, the original oh, yeah. host of Jeopardy. I remember uh, him. That was my lifelong dream. I wanted to go on and win on Jeopardy. I took a test in Portland, Maine, uh, qualified for the show, flew out to Los Angeles on my own money. They didn't pay you anything then, and the only person at that time who got money was the winner. Now I guess you get a, a little bit of uh, money even for second and third, but there was only winner. And I went up against someone, and I beat everybody in the practice round. And then in the regular round, they made me stand on a box because they wanted everyone at the same height. So already I'm feeling like a little kid standing on this box, and we got these cheesy Radio Shack-type buzzers that are just <laughs> – and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. And you can see in, in certain shows people – ringing furiously and they're the only ones that look like they're ringing in and nothing's happening and you're like okay and they're supposedly locking themselves out of the show but it all boils down to the final question of who gets it right who gets it wrong and that determines the winner if the game is close enough and my two opponents got the answer right and i got it wrong now it was a landmarks question and it was something about boston that i didn't know i i guess independence hall and it was, the answer was the Old North Church. I'm a historian. I'm from the region, and I got it wrong. They were from other parts of the country, and they aced it. I was like, <laughs> and that was the most accidentally watched show in television because I had so many friends who were flicking the dial and saw me and didn't know that I was going to be on. We're like, holy mackerel, is that? Wait. Oh, my gosh, it's him. 
and they saw it. and then they saw my my going down in flames and i have lived with that joke for for many years since i think 1993 for over 20 years Anytime I uh, make a comment, people go to me and go, well, yeah, how about that old North church? And it's like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never live that down. Never live that down. But I still watch it and still dream about going back on someday. So, Well, uh, two more questions for you. Okay. First, tell me about how you got involved with an indie film called Throg. <laughs> Great question. Um, uh, friends of mine were putting together in Maine, they did this little trailer as a kind of a project. And they took it to a, a place where there was a screen and an audience, and they showed this little silly trailer they did, and the audience went nuts. They loved it. It was kind of like the next Star Wars. And they looked at each other and said, oh dear, we have something here. So <laughs> over the course of the next three years, um, they put together a movie, kind of pieced it together piece by piece, you know, shot a scene one weekend, uh, a month later, shot another scene, that kind of thing, and finally finished a film. And they called me in at one point to play Throg Sr., the title character's father. And I did my best William Shatner uh, knockoff, you know, help us, Throg, sort of thing, <laughs> with all the, all the hammy acting you can imagine. And uh, after about a year of editing, I put it together. And it's not the worst film ever made, but certain parts of it are extremely entertaining. And we actually won Best Cinematography at the 2006 Boston International Film Festival because there were some shots in there that were absolutely beautiful and brilliant. I mean, overall, you watch it, I think, I think it would help better if you were stoned. I wouldn't know, but, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. And some people watch it just because if you know the people in it, it's a lot more funny. But it's got a lot going for it, and it's just a blast. Well, I am tempted to uh, buy it or rent it from Amazon. Just we call it. it a we call it a historical tour de farce. <laughs> okay, now finally, uh, give us a little teaser as far as your latest novel. Oh boy, the latest novel is the fourth Zach Taylor, which uh, you posted the first chapter of on the uh, blog of the Crime Cafe, so uh, listeners can go in and see that. And it's coming out next week. And it's the long awaited. This has been over two years in the making to finally get this book out. Uh, I had a number of editors on it who gave great advice and suggestions to make it better. And it's lean and mean and the latest one. And it's good to finally have it done, let me tell you. Because after two years, you will know this. You've had four Sam McRae novels published. And you know what it's like when that the novel that never ends and you're just like, oh, I've been living with this world for so long. Let it, please. I don't know about like Thomas Harris who takes seven years to write a book. I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I know. I know what you mean. And I did live with that fourth one for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes, you know that pain. I know it. Believe me, yeah. Well, um, in any case, is it uh, like, like an ultimate book? Is it, it's not the end of the series, is it? Oh, oh no, absolutely. Which is funny because there was a, I just spoke with a uh, well-known mystery writer uh, and he started about the same time I did. Coincidentally, he finished his fourth novel. His publisher has just kind of lost interest and they dropped him. So mm. he's been going about the same time as I have and his series is dead. You can't sell a series to another publisher because they're like, well, no, you've kind of, you know, yeah. Shot your bolt on that one and we're not interested. So he has to start from scratch. You and I can just keep going. You with more Sam McRae, uh, me with more Zach Taylor, and we can just keep doing it as long as we want. And that's just, just the start. But they've kind of, um, by going traditional, their brand is kind of like over and done with for the most part. They have to reinvent themselves. Yeah, I know. It's very confining. And um, it's nice to have the freedom to be able to to do what you want with your writing and now you have yourself in any way you want to now you've done some script writing now who do you see for your sam mccray novels as being the movie version of that well a couple of suggestions have been made um i believe emily blunt might have been oh, one yeah okay good good yeah yeah so um that's at least one thought i've had 
and you're starting to make some connections in that world. So uh, maybe there's a possibility of that. <laughs> yeah, I won't rule it out. <laughs> it would yeah, be we, have, we have Hank Philippi Ryan up here, and I just got noticed that um, her series is being considered for moving to the big screen. So that would be a wonderful thing. That's fantastic. She's, an, she's a great writer, extremely generous person. She's also a television investigative journalist. She has won 33 Emmys, and she's just the nicest person you could ever meet. I look at that. She has a day job. She writes these novels, and she's somewhere at a book event almost every night of the week. And I go, how does she do it? I know. It's amazing to me, the energy that people put into this sort of thing. But, um, well, in any case, uh, I think that'll, that'll do it. And um, I really appreciate your coming on the show and talking to us. Debbie, thank you so much. It's like, I wish we had more time because I can talk all night about writing and publishing and mysteries and the whole world about your, what we do. It's, it's great. Your whole life is so interesting that I probably could talk to you for an hour about all of it because you've, you've done some pretty amazing things yourself. Well, maybe we'll do another show in a year or two. How's that? That sounds good. We okay. come up with another book. <laughs> sounds great. Thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, hang on a second, and uh, I will just uh, do a little sign-off here. I just wanted to remind everybody to go to crimecafe.net or debbymac.com and click on the Crime Cafe link to find all of the podcasts and videos of the interviews here, as well as the buy button for the Crime Cafe Season 1 Story Package and for merchandise, Crime Cafe merchandise. So uh, with that, I will say that's it for this week, and I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you.